Hello, everybody. My name is Sarah Tronset, and I am a West Ottertail County Master Gardener. I've been a West Ottertail County Master Gardener since 2012, but I have been gardening for over 45 years. I'm also on the advisory committee of the West Central Research and Outreach Center. And today we're going to talk about Take Your Pulses, the nutritional world of dried beans, peas, and lentils. So what are pulses? Well, pulses are the dried edible seeds of plants in the legume family. They do not include crops harvested green, like green peas or green beans. They don't include crops used mainly for oil extract, like soybeans and peanuts. And they don't include leguminous crops that are used solely for sowing purposes such as uh, clover and alfalfa, which are used as cover crops. So pulse is derived from the Latin word pulse or pultus, meaning thick soup or porridge. So you can really either amaze your friends or confuse them totally by saying the fog is thick as pulses. They were first found 11,000 years ago in the Fertile Crescent, which is the area between the Nile and Egypt and the uh, Tigris Euphrates in what is now Iraq. So what do you think the country is the largest producer of pulses in the world? Well, it happens to be India. India is not only the largest producer of pulses in the world, but it's also the largest consumer of pulses in the world. If you have uh, experienced Indian cuisine, you probably I recognize the word dal, D-A-L. And it is the generic term for legume in India, but it also is the name of the dish that is prepared by that legume. So what state is the largest producer of pulses? Well, I think you'll be kind of surprised to know that it happens to be my home state of North Dakota. They primarily grow dried peas and beans. So what are the reasons to eat pulses? What are the nutritional values in eating pulses? Well, first of all, they're an excellent source of fiber, which uh, is necessary for digestive health. They're low in fat and cholesterol-free for cardiovascular health. They're low in sodium, so that helps with hypertension, and they're high in potassium, which is important for heart health. But keep in mind that if you're on a, a low potassium diet, uh, pulses may not be for you, so check with your doctor. There's a, there's a good, they're a good source of protein, but like most uh, plant material, they are not a complete protein source, not like meat. So in order to complete the protein and increase the protein quality, simply combine pulses with a cereal grain, such as red beans and rice. They're also a good source of iron. Iron is the leading cause of malnutrition, or one of the leading causes of malnutrition across the world. And to increase the, uh, optimize the uh, absorption of iron in pulses, you can combine that with any food that contains vitamin C. So for example, a lentil curry with uh, lemon juice on it would be an excellent way of amping up that iron. It's an excellent source of folate which is very important in pregnancy to reduce uh, birth defects. It has a low glycemic index, which helps stabilize blood sugar. And it's gluten-free if you happen to have someone in your family like I do that needs to be on a gluten-free uh, uh, diet. Now there is one downside of all of this wonderful nutrition, and that is gas. Yes, we have to discuss it. Uh, pulses contain a complex sugar called raffinose, and that is very difficult for the body to break down. And so that produces gas, along with the fiber in beans also produces gas. So if you want to try to mitigate the gas, make sure that you introduce beans and uh, other dried edibles into your diet slowly so that your body can get used to it. 
And also if you cook them a little longer and get them very soft, it might help in reducing a little bit of the gas. But raffinose is there, gas happens. So we've talked about the nutritional importance of pulses. Let's talk about the importance of pulses in the garden. Legumes fix or convert atmospheric nitrogen. Uh, nitrogen is abundant as a gas, but most plants cannot use nitrogen as a gas. Uh, legumes love nitrogen gas. They are called nitrogen fixers, meaning that they host uh, a bacteria called rhizobia on their, <clears throat> on their roots and that can take nitrogen from the air and convert it into a fo form that can be used by um, the plant roots. Now, rhizobia doesn't nat always naturally uh, happen in the soil. So you might hear that term inoculate and uh, you're inoculating your seeds and you might have to inoculate seeds uh, in order to uh, introduce rhizobia into the soil. Now, I don't do that, uh, and I don't think it's really necessary to do that in a, in a garden setting <clears throat> because they certainly can grow without the rhizobia. But if you're looking at a larger production of uh, pulses, you probably want to uh, fix or, uh, excuse me, inoculate your seeds. Now, since uh, legumes can fix their own atmospheric nitrogen, it reduces dependence on synthetic fertilizer and helps plant growth. It also improves yield and improves soil fertility, not just for the current crop, but also subsequent crops. And that's why farmers um, many times will use pulses as a rotational crop to improve soil health. Pulses are also very affordable and they have a long storage life. So they make it excellent for increasing the diversity of di diets in developing countries. So what are the types of pulses? Well, the United Nations Food and Agricultural Organization has recognized 11 different types of pulses. We're gonna focus on dried beans, dried peas, and lentils in this particular presentation, but I'd like to introduce you to some of the ones that you may not be as familiar to with before we talk about the dried peas, beans, and lentils. The first one is faba or fava beans. They're a dried broad bean. And I also, I always like to call them faba because it reminds me that legumes are the member, a member of the Fabaceae family. Faba beans are native to Mediterranean and Southeast Asia. The largest producer is China. And they are also grown in North Central North Dakota because they have an excellent, they're excellent at water uptake. So if you've got a little bit of drier soil, they can search that out quite easily. Now, fava beans have a couple of kind of interesting stories. Number one, they were used in ancient Greece to cast votes. And the second thing is that they have become known uh, with the dead. So they uh, are a common food for funerals or commemorative services of the dead in several cultures. So you might see, for example, fava beans in cookies for All Souls Day. Now the second one that we're gonna talk about is pigeon peas. They are native to South Asia. India produces about 82% of pigeon peas. They're best grown in the tropics or subtropics, but they can be grown in Southern US and Hawaii. And they are either a annual or perennial, I imagine, depending upon the climate zone. The next one that you may not be very familiar with is Bambara beans, and they're indigenous to Sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, West Africa produces about half of the world's supply, and they can be grown in the United States anywhere where peanuts can be successfully grown. And uh, that would be commercially successful. We can grow peanuts around here, but it's quite difficult. They are suitable for marginal soils and they are eaten primarily as a snack. Now lupins, 
Lupins are grown in many regions of the world, but about 85% are grown in Australia. They grow best in zones five through eight in the United States. And the yellow ones are typically sold, pickled in brine and used as a snack. And then there's a variety that's white that can be used and ground into flour and substitute, substituted for white flour, which I thought was quite interesting for those people who perhaps have to be gluten-free. Then vetches on the right-hand side there are native to all continents except Australia and Antarctica, but they are primarily used for forage. Now, cowpeas and chickpeas, you've probably heard of a little bit more. You may not be as familiar with them, but you've heard of them. Uh, the most common type of cowpea is the black-eyed pea, and that is native to West Africa, where Nigeria is the largest producer. They're grown in the southern U.S., and eating black-eyed peas on New Year's Day is considered to bring prosperity in the new year. We all could need a little prosperity in 2021. Chickpeas, the most common is garbanzo beans. But the largest producer is India. And they are in the United States, uh, the largest producer is Montana, but they are also grown in Western North Dakota. Uh, there are two types of chickpeas. They're the Kabuli type, which is the cream color, as you see here, and Desi, which are smaller and darker. If you're gonna grow um, chickpeas, make sure the variety is suitable for northern climates because there's several different varieties and some are not suited to where we live. And they are used to make that wonderful hummus, which I love. Okay, we've talked about some of the lesser known bean varieties let's or edible varieties let's talk about the ones that you probably know a little bit more about and that's the dried peas so there are four different kinds of dried peas there's the whole green whole yellow split green and split yellow now dried peas are a type of field pea grown specifically for drying Unlike many of the dried edible pulses, they are spherical in shape. Many um, pulses are more ovoid or even square, but peas are spherical and they split naturally when left to dry. Now they do have a little bit of help in the commercial world. They have a process in order to split them, but if you leave them, they will split by themselves. Whole peas may need soaking, uh, but there's no need to soak split peas before cooking, which is kind of a, a plus with them. Now, pea protein is one of the hot food trends, and it is primarily with the dried yellow peas, and that's purely economical. Uh, the, the dried green peas has its own market, and it has a high-valued market, but the yellow peas don't have quite that extensive market. And so they've been able to take the yellow peas and through a process called fractionation, they um, can extract the pea protein out of uh, the peas. It's uh, pea protein is 80% protein. It has nine essential amino acids, which means it's not a complete protein. So you can add any cereal grains such as rice to make complete protein. And the reason it's such a hot trend right now is it's used in plant-based meat. So you've probably heard of the product Beyond Meat. Uh, Beyond Meat was the largest IPO on Wall Street in 2019. And it is used in Beyond Burger, but it is not used in uh, another familiar plant-based burger called the Impossible Burger, which is, contains soy and uh, potato proteins. So be, before we discuss how we're going to grow pulses, let's discuss the way that they climb. There are three ways of climbing. One is clingers, and those are particularly um, to ivy, so the pulses don't use 
clingers or adhesive pads, but they do either use tendrils or twining. So uh, there are two types of tendrils. There are leaf tendrils and stem tendrils. Stem tendrils are used for grapes. You'll notice that if you grow grapes, the tendrils that are attached to your trellis are a little bit more woody. So they're stems. And peas use a leaf tendril to grow. Now the twiners, there are also two types of twiners, leaf and stem. Uh, the leaf twiners are like uh, clematis, and then the pole beans use the stem twining method. And again, if uh, at the end of harvest you'll see that those tendrils that you, or those twiners that you've got uh, growing on your trellis are going to be a little bit more woody. So now we know how they climb. Let's check out how we're going to grow those peas. So read the package instructions. You know, Bev Johnson, our eminent West Ottertail County Master Gardener, always says, start out by reading package instructions. It'll save you a lot of grief. They are a cool growing season, 55 to 65 degrees. You can direct sow them, provide support if needed. And there again, go back to your package. Do they have a long vine? Do they have a short vine? Uh, that will help you decide whether or not you need support. They require 95 to 100 days to mature dry seed. Uh, their ideal soy, soil is slightly acidic, 5.5 to 6.5, but they do well in a variety of, of soils and they like good drainage. So what is the oldest pulse crop known? Well, that would be lentils. And here's a field of lentils growing. There are a number of types of lentils, um, ranging from green to black with red, brown, yellow in between. We normally see green and brown in the grocery stores. Now you can get the other types of lentils in a variety stores, specialty stores, uh, organic stores will have them. They originated in the Near East or the Mediterranean region. They are one of the earliest domesticated crops. And the word lentil comes from the Latin lens because they resemble a lens, a convex lens. In, <clears throat> now, depending upon the location, lentils were either considered a poor man's food or a delicacy for the upper class. So in Greece, they were left to the less fortunate, but in Egypt, they were served to royalty. Most lentils are grown in Canada. In the US, they're grown primarily in the Pacific Northwest, Eastern Washington, Northern Idaho, and they are also grown in Western North Dakota because disease is an issue under higher moisture conditions. Now it's best to soak lentils at least two to four hours, and that's true of many of the uh, pulses. It increases the digestibility of the legumes. It liberates the plentiful minerals and they cook more quickly. Now how to grow lentils. Again, read the package instructions. They are a bush habit. They grow between 18 inches and two feet. They like peas, enjoy a cool growing season. 55 to 65, and you can sow them as early as two weeks before last frost, or they can be started indoors. They require 80 to 100 days to mature, to dry seed, and they need an ideal soil of about six to 6.5, again, slightly acetic. They prefer loose soil rich in organic matter, and they like good drainage. So that brings us to my favorite, beans, beans, the musical fruit. More than 40,000 varieties of beans in the world are, are in the world's gene banks, but just a fraction of those are produced for consumption. So what is the most popular bean? Hmm, that's interesting. It's the pinto bean. And I think that makes a lot of sense because pinto beans are in refried beans and a lot of the Mexican dishes that you love so much. 
You can also put them in chili. They're good in there too. So how to grow beans? Well, the first thing you have to do is look on the package and decide if it's a pole or a bush bean. Direct sow once the soil has warmed. Unlike peas and lentils, beans require a warm soil. So you have to have a minimum of 65 degrees for, uh, for optimizing germination. They really enjoy seven degrees a lot better. Provide support at planting if needed. Now, I, I like growing uh, vining beans because you can get them off the ground and uh, keep them away from dirt and any water splash up. So if you're growing a bush bean, you might even consider putting a, a support on, on the bush beans to keep them off the ground because once they start getting heavy with the beans, they do tend to kind of lay down a little bit and get a little dirty. Uh, they like a slightly acidic to neutral soil, so not quite as acidic as peas and lentils. They do best in clay or silty loam, but they do like good drainage, so be sure to put in some compost uh, in with your beans. And of course, they don't need as much fertilizer. In fact, because they're nitrogen fixing, I don't bother with fertilizer at all when I grow my beans in my own garden. So here's the second helping of how to grow beans. Uh, maturity time varies by variety. I have some varieties that mature as early as August, they're ready uh, to harvest, and some that aren't ready until middle of October. So make sure again that you know exactly how many days to maturity. You'll pick them when dry. So how do you know when they're really dry? Well, most pods will turn kind of a light tan or almost a white when they're when they're dry. Uh, some of the some of the pods that have markings on them, uh, they might turn a, a dark brown or a maroon, but they will turn color. And then listen for the rattle. You can take and shake those beans uh, pods, and if you hear them rattle, they're ready. And even if they're not ready, even if they're not totally ready, you think they are, and you've taken them off, and you uh, shell them and you find out that they may be a little bit larger than the ones you've been looking at or if they're a little spongy you're going to take and, and uh, just put your fingers together on top of them and if they feel a little spongy they still haven't completely dried out just put them in a shallow pan and let them dry it'll just take a few days so it's not a big deal if you get them before they're completely dry I always dry mine indoors for two weeks, like I said, in a shallow pan before storing. Beans normally need to be soaked, but there is an exception when they're freshly harvested, when you've just taken them off the, um, the trellis and shelled them out. They don't need to be soaked. You can cook them directly. They will need to be soaked with, when you store them because uh, it doesn't take very long for them to get dry, but right away you don't need to soak them. And the greatest thing about beans is that you can save seeds for next year. Some vegetables, it's very, very difficult to save seed, as you all well know. But beans are one that you can save seeds and they keep forever. Okay, let's look at the type of dried beans that are available commercially. Uh, there are a, a number of them, black, kidney, navy beans. I'd like to talk about three um, beans here specifically. Uh, adzuki or azuki beans, also called red English mung beans. And they're the ones that are made into Chinese bean paste for Chinese desserts. And I, uh, we, my husband and I saw a cute little movie um, oh, a couple of weeks ago. It was called Sweet Bean. It's in Japanese with subtitles. And it's just a poignant, lovely little movie. And a lot of the movie is about making this sweet bean paste out of uh, azuki beans. So if you're interested in looking at the uh, how that's made and you see that on one of the cable channels, uh, be sure to look at it. It's kind of cute. Uh, the Great Northern Bean we'll talk about a little bit later. And then the last one on the list, which is pink, uh, you probably don't see those 
in the retail stores because uh, the vast majority of pinks are sold to a large fast food franchise for use in their chili. So the last thing we're gonna talk about is heirloom beans. And I love heirloom beans. Uh, they are wonderful to give for gifts because of their color markings. And they are also very wonderful because they also can be ornamental. So you can use them in your edible landscape. Uh, they have beautiful flowers and pods. Uh, the uh, speckled cranberry beans that I grow have a beautiful red and green pod on them. So uh, they would look great in your uh, landscape also. Okay, these are the four that I normally grow. Uh, speckled cranberry, Cherokee Trail of Tears, Hidatsa Shield Figure, and Painted Pony. They're all heirlooms. And I get most of my beans from Seed Savers Exchange in Decorah, Iowa, but I have gotten beans from other places also. Uh, the speckled cranberry beans do not hold their color as they dry and they don't hold their color after they're cooked. So they're just a beautiful cranberry and white when you harvest them, but as they age, they will get to be a brown with darker brown markings on them and then the markings go completely away when you cook them. Hadatsa Shield Figure and Painted Pony, however, keep their markings even after they're completely dry and they keep their markings when they are cooked. Cherokee Trail of Tears or any black bean, you want to cook separately because if you don't, everything turns gray. Don't ask me how I know that. Here's four more. We'll be talking a little bit more about the most dollar wild goose. That's got some interesting markings. Jacob's Cattle. I've never grown Jacob's Cattle, but I have grown Jacob's Cattle Gold. So instead of the red, it's a gold color. And then it has uh, white markings, but not quite as prominent as the white markings on Jacob's cattle. There is also something called Tiger's Eye, which is a gold with a kind of a um, maroon marking, and Good Mother Stollard, which looks somewhat similar to speckled cranberry beans. The next one is Turkey Craw. And I grow, I grew that, uh, I grew that in 2020, and I really like this bean. It is a vine, and it has, uh, it's a, a little bit of a smaller bean. It has uh, beautiful markings. It does keep its, um, its uh, color when you uh, and markings when you cook it. So that's nice. As does calypso. Calypso is a black and white bean and it's also very colorful. Um, the color and the wonderful markings of the beans just make such a lovely gift. If you layer uh, different beans in a, in a glass jar and, and give it to somebody, it's, it's really something very, very special, particularly if it comes out of your own garden. Then the last two are Yellow Indian Woman and Arikora Yellow. And you'll notice that several of the bean varieties have uh, Native American uh, names to them. And many of the varieties uh, were cultivated by the Native communities. Indigenous Seed Keepers Network uh, is an organization that is working with Seed Savers Exchange and other organizations to rematriate seeds back to the communities of origin. Uh, both men and women women farmed and planted seeds, but the woman was uh, charged with the stewardship of the seeds. And because women are traditionally the keepers of the seeds, this is called seed rematriation rather than repatriation. And it's also bringing the seed back to Mother Earth. Again, a connotation of the importance of the woman as stewards of those seeds. So those are the seed types. Now let's go into the bean stories. Uh, I don't think you ever hear kale stories, but there are lots of bean stories. So let's, let's look at a few of those. So the first one is the Three Sisters Garden. 
and you, many of you have probably heard of the three sisters. It's simply a companion planting and it's made up of corn, beans, and squash, but not the corn, beans, and squash that we think of, not the sweet corn and the fresh peas and maybe the zucchini. The corn was maize, which was dried and pounded into a flour. The beans were also uh, dried edibles and they were dry and the squash was winter squash and all three of those could be stored for longer periods of time. Now they were compatible in the garden. Uh, beans, uh, the corn was used as a trellis for the beans. Uh, the beans provided nutrients for uh, the corn and they stabilized the corn in high winds and the squash um, the large leaves of the squash could shade the soil for moisture retention and weed prevention. But in addition to the symbiosis in the garden, they are also symbiotic in the nutritional world. So corn is uh, an ideal food foundation, but it lacks two essential amino acids, lysine and tryptophan, so these are provided by the beans. And again, uh, there again, beans in combination with the cereal grain makes a more complete protein. And then carbohydrate rich squashes are a great source of vitamin A and their seeds provide a quality vegetable fat. Together, they, the three can constitute a real nice nutritional package. Of course, they could store a long time and be taken on journeys. The next bean story that I'd like to talk about is uh, the bean man, John Withy. So John Withy was born in Portland, Maine. His longtime profession was medical photography. And he set out to find varieties of beans that he remembered from his childhood, particularly Jacob's cattle. But what he discovered was a whole cornucopia of varieties that he never knew existed. And, and if he didn't know they existed, he figured out, well, nobody else knew they existed. So he uh, went around to a few of the old time gardeners and generations of families that had saved beans and he started collecting beans as a hobby. And it, that hobby kind of combined everything that he really liked. He liked adventure and he liked discovery and he liked travel. And he liked the opportunity to meet people. So it became an ideal hobby for him. And he amassed 1,186 varieties of beans. Well, in 1981, he donated those beans to Seed Savers Exchange and that, donation became the catalyst that propelled Seed Savers Ex Exchange to be the largest non-governmental seed bank in the United States. And then Seed Savers Exchange took those beans and many of those beans are located in the Svalbard Global Seed Vault. And I wanna talk a little bit about Svalbard. So Svalbard, the Svalbard Global Seed Bank uh, Vault was built in 2008 by the Norwegian government. It's located in Spitsbergen, Norway, about 800 miles from the North Pole. It's highly remote, it's highly secured. Um, it's a storage facility that accommodates 1 million seed samples. And they store seed samples from countries and institutions around the world as an insurance policy against the loss of diversity due to natural disasters, war, changes in global farming practices. Uh, every country or institution that stores seeds in the vault has control over that, uh, they still own and control the access to that seed. According to various estimates, the United States has lost up to 90% of its fruit and vegetable varieties since the 1900s. So these seed vaults are extremely important 
to make sure that we have diversity in our, our seed banks. So the next one that we're going to talk about is Oscar H. Will and the Great Northern Bean. Oscar H. Will arrived in uh, the Dakota Territory in 1881, and he started a seed catalog in Bismarck, North Dakota. He printed his first catalog in 1884, and his catalogs always emphasized varieties that were well suited to the conditions and shorter growing season of the Northern Plains. He uh, traded many varieties with the Native American tribes, especially the Hadatsa. And in about 1886, he acquired a bag of white kidney-shaped beans from Son of Star, who was an Hadatsa. And Oscar Will experimented with that bean for 10 years and developed a bean that he named Great Northern which is a large white kidney-shaped bean. It was first released in his catalog in 1896, and is one of the most common beans uh, on the market. It is also a named variety. For example, we hear kidney bean, navy bean, uh, black bean, but <clears throat> the variety Great Northern is so common that it is given its own named variety. And Bush Brothers was one of the first to use these beans. They started out as a tomato canning company in the turn of the 20th century. And, um, but they didn't start using beans in their products until 1950s. And Bush's beans, that's the one I, do, I go to. The original Bush's baked beans is the one that I use in my three bean casserole. And we all know we have a favorite three bean casserole. Every one of us does. Someplace in our recipe file. And the last one, I told you we we're going to talk again about the most dollars wild goose bean. I think this is my favorite story. So the most dollars were from Pennsylvania. And the matriarch of the family, Joseph Mostaller, was a sawmill owner with his, um, with his uh, sons, John and David. And so uh, they built the mist mill race to the sawmill to divert water. And one day, a goose, uh, kind of oblivious to what was going on, wandered into the mill race. And the sons thought this would be a good dinner. So they captured the goose and they brought it to Sarah, John's wife, to fix for dinner. Well, Sarah noticed that there were beans in the craw of the goose, and she took those out, placed them on a ledge, and let them dry out. And they planted those seeds in 1866. They noticed that it had a short growing season, and that it was probably grown further north, possibly from the corn planter Indians in Upper Allegheny. And those beans were shared by Ralph Mostaller, who is a descendant of Joseph, with John Withy, the bean man, who gave them to Seed Saver ex Exchange, who have probably given it to the Svalbard Gold Global Seed Vault. So it's just a circle of life in the bean world. That concludes my bean presentation. Uh, I would like to give a special shout out to Seed Savers Exchange. Uh, I, uh, as I said before, I get most of my beans from Seed Savers Exchange, but they were also very generous in giving me several different uh, samples of beans that they have in their collection. And you would have seen if we were in, in, um, in person, unfortunately, that's not the case. And then also Northern Pulse Growers Association, they were also very, very generous in sharing a lot of information on how pulses were grown in uh, the upper Midwest. So I, I'd really like to also thank them for their contribution to this presentation. So that's all. I hope that you enjoyed the presentation. I hope that you recognize the nutritional and garden um, qualities of beans, and I hope you start growing beans and enjoying them as much as I do. Thanks so much. Stay safe.